across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else in the course of the day, and I would have no time for a constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should give the reason for my being in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the argument of outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliate organizations all across the South, one being the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Whenever necessary and possible, we share staff, educational, and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promises. So I am here along with several members of my staff because we have been invited here. I am here because I have basic organizational ties here. Beyond this, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutality tied in a single garment of destiny. Wherever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider. You deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham, but I am sorry that your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the demonstrations into being. I am sure that each of you would want to go beyond the superficial social analyst who looks merely at effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. I would not hesitate to say that this is an unfortunate that so-called demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham at this time, but I would say in more emphatic terms that it is even more unfortunate that the white power structure of this city left the Negro community with no other alternative. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps, collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all of these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gainsaying of the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of police brutality is known in every section of this country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in the courts is notorious, a notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. On the basis of them, Negro leaders have sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the political leaders consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Then came the opportunity last September to talk with some of the leaders of the economic community. In these negotiating sessions, certain promises were made by the merchants, such as the promise to remove the humiliating racial signs from the stores. On the basis of these promises, Reverend Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to call a mortuarium on any type of demonstration. As the weeks and months unfolded, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. The signs remained. As in so many experiences of the past, we were confronted with blasted hopes and the dark shadow of a deep disappointment settled upon us. 
So we had no alternative except that of preparing for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and national community. We were not unmindful of the difficulties involved. So we decided to go through a process of self-purification. We started having workshops on nonviolence and repeatedly asked ourselves the questions, are you able to accept blows without retaliation? And are you able to endure the ordeals of jail? We decided to set our direct action program around the Easter season, realizing that with the exception of Christmas, this was the largest shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action, we felt this was the best time to bring pressure on the merchants for the needed changes. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to traumatize that the issue that it can no longer be ignored. It just referred to the creation of tension as a part of the work of the nonviolent registrar. This may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly worked and preached against violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension that is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and have truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal. We must see the need of having non-violent gadflies to create analysis and objective appraisal. Create the kind of tension in society that will help men to rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. So the purpose of direct action is to create a situation so crisis packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. We therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in the tragic attempt to live in monologue rather than dialogue. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. Since we so diligently urged people to obey the Supreme Court decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in the public schools, it is rather strange and paradoxical to find us consciously breaking laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer is found in the fact that there are two types of laws. There are just laws and there are unjust laws. An unjust law is no law at all. Let us turn to a more concrete example of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is a code that a majority inflicts on a minority that is not binding on itself. This difference made legal. On the other hand, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow and that is willing to follow itself. This is shame, sameness made legal. Let me give you another explanation. An unjust law is a code inflicted upon a minority which that minority had no part in enacting or creating because it did not have the unhampered right to vote. Who can say that the legislature of Alabama which set up the segregation laws was democratically elected? Throughout the state of Alabama, all types of conning methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters, and there are some countries without a single Negro registered to vote, despite the fact that Negroes constitute a majority of the population. Can any law set up in such a state be considered democratically structured? There are just a, these are just a few examples of unjust and just laws. 
There are some instances when a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. For instance, I was arrested Friday on a charge of parading without a permit. Now, there is nothing wrong with an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade, but when the ordinance is used to preserve segregation and to deny citizens the First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and peaceful protest, then it becomes unjust. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The urge for freedom will eventually come. This is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom. Something without has reminded him that he can gain it. Consciously and unconsciously, he has been swept in by what the Germans call the zeitgeist. And with his black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America, and the Caribbean, he is moving with a sense of cosmic urgency towards the promised land of racial injustice. Recognizing this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand public demonstrations. The Negro has many pent up resentments and latent frustrations. He has to get them out. Let him march sometime. Let him have his prayer. Uh, pr 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 the pr pilgrimages to the city hall, understanding why he must have sit-ins and freedom rides. If, he, if his repressed emotions do not come out in this nonviolent ways, they will come out in ominous expressions of violence. This is not a threat, it is a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent, but I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be challenged through the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. Now this approach is being dismissed as extremist. I must admit I was initially disappointed in being so categorized. I had hoped that the white moderate would see this. Maybe I am too optimistic. Maybe I expected too much. I guess I should have realized that few members of a race have has had oppressed another race can understand or appreciate the deeper groans and passionate yearnings of those that have been oppressed, and still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. I am thankful, however, that some of our white brothers have grasped the meaning of this social revolution and committed themselves to it. They are still all too small in quantity, but they are big in quality. Some like Ralph McGill, Lillian Smith, Harry Golden, and James Dabbs have written about our struggle in elegant, prophetic, and understanding terms. Others have marched with us down nameless streets of the South. They sat in with us at lunch counters and rode in with us on freedom rides. They have languished in filthy, roach-infested jails, suffering the abuse and brutality of angry policemen who see them as dirty nigger lovers. They, unlike many of their moderate brothers, have recognized the urgency of the movement and sensed the need for powerful action antidotes to combat the disease of segregation. I had the strange feeling when I was suddenly catapulted into the leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery several years ago that we would have the support of the white church. I felt that the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be some of our strongest allies. Instead, some few have been outright opponents refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the security of stained glass windows. In spite of my shattered dreams of the past, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leadership of this community would see the justice for our cause and with deep moral concern serve the channel through which our grievances could get to the power structure. I have hoped that each of you would understand, but again, I have been disappointed. I have heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers say, follow your decree because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. In midst of blatant injustices afflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churches stand on the sidelines and merely mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. 
in the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I heard so many ministers say those are social issues which the gospel has nothing to do with. And I have watched so many churches commit themselves to completely otherworldly religion which made a strange distinction between bodies and souls, the sacred and the secular. I must close now. But before closing, I am impelled to mention one other point in your statement that troubled me profoundly. You warmly condemned the Birmingham police force for keeping order and preventing violence. I don't believe you would have so warmly commended the police force if you had seen its angry, violent dogs literally biting six unarmed, non-violent Negroes. I don't blame you that you would so quickly condemn the police if you would observe their ugly and inhumane treatment of Negroes here in the city jail. If you would watch them push and curse old Negro women and young Negro girls. If you would see them slap and kick old Negro men and young boys. If you would observe them, and they did on two occasions, refusing to give us food because we wanted to sing our grace together. I'm sorry that I can't join you in your praise for your police department. It is true that there have been rather disciplined in their public handling of the demonstrators. In this sense, they have been publicly nonviolent, but for what purpose? To preserve the evil system of segregation. Over the last few years, I have constantly preached that nonviolent demands that the means we must be as pure as the ends we speak. So I have tried to make it clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to attain moral ends. But now I must affirm that it is just as wrong and even more to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. I wish you had condemned the Negro demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage, their willingness to suffer, and their amazing discipline in the midst of the most inhuman provocation. One day the South will recognize its real heroes. They will be the James Merediths courageously and with a majestic sense of purpose facing jeering and hostile mobs and agonizing loneliness that characterizes the life of the pioneer. They will be old, oppressed, battered Negro women symbolized in a 72-year-old woman of Montgomery, Alabama, who rose up with a sense of dignity and with her people decided not to ride the segregated buses and responded to one who inquired about her tiredness with an ungrammatically profundity. My feet is tired, but my soul is rested. There will be young high school and college students, young ministers of the gospel, and a host of their elders courageously and nonviolently sitting in at lunch counters and willingly going to jail for conscience sake. One day the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sit down at a lunch counter, they were in reality standing up for the best in the American dream and the most sacred values in our Judeo-Christian heritage. Never before have I written a letter this long, or should I say a book? I'm afraid that it is much too long to take your precious time. I can assure you that it would have been much shorter if it had been written from a comfortable desk. But what else is there to do when you are alone for days in the dull monotony of a narrow jail cell other than write long letters, think strange thoughts, and pray long prayers? If I had said anything in this letter that is an understatement of the truth and is indicative of an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me. If I have said anything in this letter that is an overstatement of the truth and is indicative of my having a patience that makes me patient with anything less than brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King Jr. So thank you, thank you. So when um, I recited this letter back in 2011 here at the college, um, it was due to, uh, there were several different uh, humanities instructors who uh, were actually teaching some of the lessons of injustice and racism in their classes at the time. And so they had asked that, hey, let's do something. Uh, let's have a presentation. Uh, and they actually brought this to me, to my attention, this letter from Birmingham Jail. It's sad to say I never had, uh, had read the letter before, or heard the letter before. Uh, and this is a very short version of a long, long, long letter. Uh, but it was very powerful. In, in, in honor of Dr. King, there's a couple things I just want to leave you all with about just how amazing he was. And I do this with my speech class that I, my, as an adjunct instructor here 
for the college. Um, and there's a couple of different things. One of my favorite speeches that he gave was, what's your life's blueprint? Uh, and if you ever get the opportunity to see that, uh, I re really strongly encourage you to read that, what's your life's blueprint? Um, and I feel that working in higher education or being a student in higher <laughs> education, we're all following a blueprint. Us who are educators are following the blueprint that we went through to give you as students the opportunity to be able to follow whatever your life's blueprint is. And so he was such a genius. He started preaching when he was in his 20s. Uh, he was a wise, wise young man uh, when he first started, but he always was thinking about other people. So I challenge you with the question, what's your life's blueprint? As you continue to do this journey on your life, but probably the most famous speech that gives me the most goosebumps is his very last speech in Memphis, Tennessee. And I like to show this video because I really want to educate people. There's two speeches that give me goosebumps. One is uh, former NC State men's basketball coach Jim Valvano's speech, Don't Ever Give Up, don't, Never Give Up, Don't Ever Give Up. Uh, and then this one by Dr. King, it was his last speech when he was in Memphis uh, speaking to the sanitation workers. Why it was so powerful to me is because Rarely do you hear individuals who know they're going to die speak to other people. And if you watch this speech, which if you haven't, I strongly encourage you to do, you could see his emotions were so powerful. And there were different, different parts of the speech that were powerful. When he told people, he said, I might not get there with you, but I have been to the promised land, all right? And I have seen, and then you could just tell with him the crowd was still cheering and feeling empowered because he was uplifting the crowd, but you could start to see him get emotional. So then he went on through the speech. He said, I'm not fearing any man. My lies have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And then he just kind of fell back. He fell back into where he fell into the arms of somebody who was standing. But he didn't really even finish because he fell back. Uh, and I, and I, every time I watch this video and I show it to my class and I want them to understand the power of that, that somebody who their life's blueprint was bigger than them. And then I'll close with the most famous, I have a dream speech. Now, if anybody's ever been in my speech class, you know I challenged you before to tell me the exact name of the speech, which is not the I have a dream speech. It is called Normal See No More. Well, there's many other names that people tend to share. But what's powerful about this speech is if you were able to go to Washington DT to uh, the National African American Museum, you'll actually see that there is a script of the speech and there was nothing about I have a dream on that speech. Mahalia Jackson, who was a famous gospel singer, happened to be my grandma's favorite gospel singer back in the day. That's how I knew about her before this even. Uh, it was at the March on Washington, uh, and she, he was standing up giving his speech, and she yelled at him. She said, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And he went impromptu about I have a dream. This was not written. This came straight from his mind and his heart and his soul, and he shared that speech with everybody. Let's go. I want to show you something. Go back to the life's blueprint real quick. I want to show you how powerful a dream is. This man stood there and gave a speech about I have a dream, right? That many of us have recited for years. I remember as a little boy reciting that speech, right? I, I remember it. I pretty much know it almost by heart. I haven't heard it so much and recited it. But it was about his dream for us. So here we are many years later, and we're fulfilling his dream. His dream. What's your dream? That's how powerful dreams are. But I understand that a lot of us are living nightmares and we're scared to dream. But I'm going to tell you a little secret about dreams and nightmares. We can always wake up from a nightmare, but we should never stop dreaming. Let me say that one more time. Chippa, chippa, remix. <laughs> we can always wake up from a nightmare, but we should never stop dreaming. So, in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, and, and have an opportunity. First of all, I want to thank uh, um, the, the Cultural Awareness Committee for allowing me to come and to present here for, uh, for Black History Month and to share uh, this wonderful letter. Uh, but I also want you all to think about some of the powerful lessons from Dr. Martin Luther King and many of our other champions who have, who have laid the foundation for us all to walk today. No matter where background they come from, we are here now because of our grandparents, our great grandparents, and so many others who have laid the foundation for us to create our blueprint and to make our dreams come true. So while we are an institution of high learning, let's do everything we can to learn from each other. Because students, we learn from you, and we hope 
and wish that you could learn from us. We, I said wish, because sometimes we don't know if you listen when we tell you things. <laughs> But we wish that you would listen to us, but we also learn from you, because you can tell us how to TikTok and do so many other things that we don't know how to do, right? Because this is your world. It's a part of your blueprint, but also we want you to learn from ours. So with that being said, I'm going to shut up, and I just want to say thank you again, and I hope that you all enjoyed uh, this, uh, this reciting of this uh, historic lab. Thank you.